My name is uh, Eric Pappas. I'm Emeritus Professor in the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney in Australia. I'm an optometrist, obviously, I've been an academic optometrist for a number of years, but I haven't always been in academia. So Eric's career really has been quite interesting because he's been involved in either industry or in conducting confidential research for companies within the Brian Holden Vision Institute, as well as an independent researcher with his uh, enormous number of graduate students. I would view Eric as a translational researcher. He takes science, he takes chemistry, he takes lab-based information and translates it into the clinical practice. His research is really driven by the clinical problems, whether it's the contact lens related environment, discomfort, whether it's dry eye. So he's very focused on solving a clinical problem. Eric's contributions to research have been really remarkable. He's one of the uh, co-inventors of a breakthrough material for contact lenses a highly oxygen permeable material which is now called silicon hydrogels. He actually demonstrated objectively that the limbal blood vessels in a person wearing a silicon hydrogel contact lens are equivalent to someone not wearing contact lenses at all. He's also worked in other areas such as dry eye disease, contact lens related adverse events, presbyopia, just to name a few. The kind of research that, that I'm involved with is, is unlike many people in this position, it's quite broad. Many people have one or two ideas that they pursue for a, a lot of their career. And I've been a little bit broader than that. I've, I've had the fortune to look at a number of different uh, areas, all to do with the, the anterior eye, uh, really. You know, one of the great things when you think about Eric, as someone who's a dean, who's been in that sort of administrative position, he's one of our rare triple threats. He's just sort of good at everything. But on top of that, he's humble. So he's one of those great academics who cares more about his mentees, his students, rather than his own ego. I learn something from all my students. They teach me things uh, about science, they teach me things about uh, how to teach, they teach me things about the world in general. A lot of young people come along and have benefited from Eric, both as a mentor and supervisor, as well as a, a thought leader in the era of vision science in which he has specialised in. I finished my PhD 11 years ago, and even now, 11 years later, if I have something on my mind, whether it be in my academic life or uh, in my personal life, something that I want to discuss with a friend, Eric is the first on my list of people to call. Eric has been such an inspiring PhD mentor to me. So after I completed my PhD, I wanted to share that with the world. So I created a lecturing tour in Ghana and I asked him to come to Ghana with me to inspire the Ghanaian optometry students and the Ghanaian optometrist in Ghana. When we were in Ghana, he just wowed everyone. He was like a celebrity because everyone wanted to take pictures with him after the lectures. And he did such a great job sharing his knowledge and inspiring the next generation of optometrists in Ghana. Eric's ripple effects are through the people that he has influenced through his career. He has supervised tens of PhD students and all these people now are working in different parts of the world, in areas as academia, private practices, and a contact lens industry. We sort of call him the grandfather, uh, and that's not meant to be insulting. So he, for example, mentored me and supervised my PhD, and then I've now gone on to supervise other people, and then we're supervising people together. So that makes him, I guess, the grandpa. I grew up in the UK in a town uh, called Blackburn and they have a, a football team called Blackburn Rovers who, given that you grow up in the town, you support almost naturally. He has one, one really unfortunate thing about his life is that he's cursed with having been born near Blackburn and having to support Blackburn Rovers. He's a long-standing Blackburn Rovers supporter, so someone has to be, I guess. That sort of love for the team never really leaves you. I sometimes wish it would because they're not that successful right now. His lifelong Blackburn Rovers fan. How could you not love someone who can do that? I've always been quite sporty, and as a younger man, football, soccer was the thing that I played a lot of. Also track and field, I, I was a, a triple jumper and a sprinter. Triple jumping particularly uh, destroys your knees, and, and it didn't do my knees any good, so 
um, at some point you have to stop competing and, and stop playing. And, and when that happened, I was looking around for something else and, and, and I came to cycling and cycling uh, has saved me really, it keeps me fit. Um, I ride more or less every day, uh, as a commuter mostly, but uh, for, for you know pleasure at the weekends. I love cycling, it's, it, it's great uh, and keeps me fit and shows me a little bit of the world around. So, so right now, I'd say I'm a cyclist, yeah. You don't need to be in Eric's company for very long to realise that he's a very smart person. Eric is dedicated, he is passionate, and he has the ability to inspire the people around him. He's a true standout in our field. He's just super. So he's super smart, he's super helpful, he's you know, super kind, he's just a super person to know. He's such a warm man, you know, and he's, he's just delightful to work with and to have as a friend. He always makes you smile. He is the kindest, the most thoughtful person that I know. And I am where I am today because of him. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is a, an unbelievable honor. And just as a, a piece of housekeeping, just to get out of the way, my um, disclosures, these are the companies uh, on the uh, left hand side who sponsor me at the moment and on the right people who have sponsored me in the past. Um, I, it's such an amazing honor to be on this podium speaking to this award because the list of people who've had this award previously is just amazing and it just blows me away to, to think that my name could be added to this list so so thank you to the academy for this amazing uh, award um, and uh, thanks to all the people that have helped me uh, to get this thing together today so Helen and Sue that's amazing and Melissa um, I'd also like to thank the people that nominated me for this um, it's so good of them to think of me in these terms and the people that have supported me uh, in, in the video um, and I'd also like to thank Dave Emmerling for making uh, that video and for persuading those people to say nice things about me and actually for leaving out all the bad stuff. So that's good. So your check's in the post, Dave. So I thought I'd just go back to the beginning. And, um, oh, just before I do that, actually, there's another thing I want to say, because there's one more person that deserves some thanks. And that's Gary Osborne, because yesterday I was walking through the conference center and Gary Osborne came up to me and he said, Eric, I'd like to give you something. And what he gave me was this. And this is a first edition copy of Ophthalmic Lenses by Charles F. Prentice. How brilliant is that? So that's just a fantastic gift. <laughs> Gary, where are you, Gary? Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is something, you know, just, just to treasure beyond all things. It's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. So back to the beginning. And um, I wasn't actually going to be a researcher. I wasn't going to be an optometrist. Um, I was doing physics as an undergraduate, and, and these things were just not on the agenda uh, for me. Um, and I actually wasn't a very good physicist, so um, I was looking around for something that might pay my wages and, and give me uh, a meal ticket. And optometry was suggested by a friend of mine, an old school friend. And so I went to see my own optometrist, um, and he told me what optometrists do. Um, and I, you know, quickly, decided it was a good thing for me to follow as a career. So I went back to university, to the University of Manchester, and became an optometrist, did the degree. But still, I wasn't really thinking about a research career, although I have to say that I did publish my first paper as an undergraduate at Manchester, and it was a paper on autorefractors, the Nidec autorefractor. And at the time, we were dead scared that autorefractors were going to take away our life, livelihoods and careers. And I'm very happy to say that didn't happen. So then I went into private practice and I worked with this man, Ross Maskell. He is an amazing contact lens practitioner and he, he taught me everything that I know about contact lens practice. Um, he did something else for me as well, which is that Ross used to do a contact lens clinic at the university and one day he said to me, Eric, I can't do the clinic today, would you cover it for me? And I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, I did that clinic for him and of course he never did it again, I did it every week after that. So um, it was kind of a return to the university in a different capacity. And interestingly, um, in those teaching clinics, one of the people that I encountered was the Glenn Fry lecturer this morning, 
Alex Bowers. She was actually one of my contact lens students, which is uh, quite amazing to think. There's another Manchester connection, of course, as well, because Nathan Efron was a former head of school at the department in Manchester. So uh, with three of us with Manchester connections on the podium today, um, yay, Manchester. <laughs> Phil, head, and the current head of school is here today as well. So thanks, Phil. <laughs> So it was while doing this that I encountered another uh, great important person in my life, and that was Richard Abadi. Richard uh, was a researcher at the university, and, and he taught me into doing a, a, a master's degree in research. And he taught me several techniques, including psychophysical techniques and, and how to assess subjective responses. But Richard also taught me about the value of discussion, about how important it is to discuss your work with your peers and your students and your colleagues as a means of bouncing ideas around. And not all of those discussions took place in the lab. Richard was quite a keen sportsman and we used to play, play a little bit of cricket in this case. And here we are um, in a staff student cricket match at the university. So Richard was a, an amazing person. And the work that we were doing in those days was working with people who had albinism. And Richard's idea was that the irides of these people, which are not a, a very good aperture stop for the eye, could be improved by fitting them with tinted contact lenses or iris print contact lenses. And so we did this in a number of people and were able to show, in fact, that we could improve their resistance to glare sources and their vision contrast sensitivity performance increased while they were wearing these lenses. So this is my first research paper which I generated my own data for. Um, while I was in this period, one of the things that we used to go to was, were conferences, and at the BCLA conference, actually, um, I ran into this man, Graham Young. Graham Young then offered me a job. He said, why don't you come and work for us in, in industry? So um, I actually took that offer and went to work for what was then the Hydron company, Hydron Contact Lens Company, subsequently taken over um, by Allegan. Um, but they had a, a research clinic in the centre of London where they did contact lens related research. But also we fitted contact lenses for a couple of ophthalmologists, one of whom was Montague Rubin, who is probably the father of contact lenses in ophthalmology. And the other one was Roger Buckley, who uh, died recently, but he was also a wonderful contact lens um, friend in, in ophthalmology. So that was a fantastic period. And we did a little bit of research as well. One of the things we did was to show that diffractive bifocals, which we were working with at the time, were more resistant to um, uh, changes in pupil size than refractive uh, contact lenses. The other thing Graham did was introduce me to the academy. And the first meeting that I came to was with Graham, and it was in Denver. And I well remember coming from sea level London to mile high Denver and going out for a run, getting about two blocks and having to walk home because I was absolutely exhausted with the thin atmosphere. And at an academy meeting, I met another really important person, and that was this man, Brian Holden. Brian said to me, after a couple of times meeting me, he said, um, why don't you come and work with us in Australia? Now, at that time, the Cornea and Contact Lens Research Unit had working there, or had had working there, just about everybody who was important in the contact lens business. All these names were just stellar names, and so it was the place to be, the place uh, to go and work. And so when he said, why don't you come and work with us in Australia? Of course, I said no. <laughs> and I went back to London for a year. But then again, I bumped into to Brian at a, another meeting a, a year or two later. And he renewed the offer and I accepted, moved to Australia. And of course, I've been there ever since. The project that we were working on at the time, the big project, was this thing called the C3 project. And of course, um, as Percy Lazon said in, in the video, the purpose of this project was to develop highly oxygen permeable contact lenses. And it was done in the context of a, a multidisciplinary collaborative team between a series of different scientists, material scientists, clinical scientists, etc., just to produce or uh, develop this contact lens. And of course it was successful. And these lenses and lenses developed by, by other companies in the field are now the dominant lenses in the market. So that was a really exciting uh, and, and interesting time for me. While I'm talking about the interactions with industry, uh, I think it's important, certainly for me, but for other people to recognize that not everybody has the ability to publish papers and, and to stand on, on podia like I do 
uh, and get these awards because they're working in situations where maybe you can't publicize your work as easily and as readily as many of us can. So I just wanted to take a second to recognize those people in industry who do great work but probably don't get the recognition that they deserve. These are just some of the people that I've had the good fortune to work with. There are many, many others, so I apologize if your name isn't here, but um, I still uh, am very grateful for your excellence. So it was working with silicon hydrogel lenses in the clinic that we noticed that the eyes of people wearing these lenses look rather whiter than the uh, uh, hydrogel wearing eyes that we've been used to seeing. And at this time, we thought hydrogel related limbal redness was just normal. And it turned out, or it seemed to us, that if you wore a highly oxygen permeable lens, this went away. And of course, this then formed the basis for my PhD work. And I just wanted to mention these four people in that context, because Dan O'Leary and Des Fon actually talked me into doing a PhD, because I wasn't actually that keen at the time. So um, they said, you've got to do it. And, and particularly Des has been a, a, a great friend and a, a, a mentor and a source of, uh, of counsel over many, many years. And I'm really uh, grateful to Des. Uh, so thanks, Des. He's here today. And I, I'm very grateful to Des for his friendship and his support. The other two people, of course, uh, put their hands up to be my supervisors, Fiona Stapleton and Brian Holden. And um, I don't know if it's something that they regret, but I don't know what, a, what I was like as a student, but I'm very grateful to them for doing that for me. Um, the, the, one of the main findings, of course, was that there's this nice relationship between oxygen permeability of the lens and the redness at the limbus uh, of, uh, of the eye. We were able to show that the higher the DK on T, then the lower the redness. And of course, using this relationship, you can predict what level of oxygen permeability, transmissibility, you need to eliminate that redness response. And the number we came up with was 125. At the time, that was quite controversial because it was higher than some people wanted um, and lower than others wanted. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that in the paper, we said, because there are error boys on this relationship, there's uncertainties, we probably want to take the lower bound of those confidence intervals as something to shoot for, rather than thinking of 125 as being the absolute number. And I think since then, um, history has, has sort of borne out that that was a reasonably good uh, idea for us to, to shoot at. So the PhD basically showed that the reason for this redness response is oxygen. So if you eliminate oxygen from the eye in a goggle, you get a redness response. So we, we proved um, in the lab that that was the case. But one of the problems we found was that we got more swelling, uh, sorry, not swelling, more redness with the contact lens than we got with the goggle. And that was slightly puzzling. And it turns out the same thing happens with corneal swelling. So um, the data on the right are from um, uh, uh, Nathan, Noel, and, and Leo Carney, uh, and the data on, on the other side are from Debbie Sweeney. But you can see there's a discrepancy between the amount of swelling you get in a contact lens and the amount of swelling you get in a goggle if you remove all the oxygen. So we're a bit puzzled by this, and we um, had some conversations about what it was, and Debbie Sweeney and I thought, well, in the closed eye situation, the ocular surface gets oxygen from the vascular plexus of the eyelid. So in the open eye, maybe some of that oxygen gets through as well with blinking. Maybe uh, there's a, a privilege to the ocular surface just by blinking, putting oxygen into the tears. And so we were able to work out that this contribution from the lid, this so-called lid-derived oxygen response, was around about 5% equivalent oxygen percentage, which is quite a lot, really. And if you adjust for this uh, EOP of about 5%, you can, in fact, eliminate this discrepancy in um, the, the curves between the goggle situation and the contact lens situation. So doing that, we were able to um, move these curves slightly to the right and eliminate that discrepancy, and that kind of solved the problem. So we know from this then that goggle studies actually probably underestimate the amount of, uh, uh, of uh, hypoxia that they produce, and it's actually only possible to get complete hypoxia if you have a contact lens in the eye with a low DK on T. So oxygen does many things, but one of the things it doesn't really do well is to eliminate discomfort. And we kind of knew this because we had data from swelling studies which showed us that um, there's no real relationship between the amount of um, oxygen that we have and the comfort response. Blanka Golubioski, who was uh, my first PhD student, showed that really there's no relationship between 
corneal sensitivity and oxygen transmissibility. And so we were a bit puzzled as to why contact lenses cause this classic end of day discomfort response that about a third of wearers get because it's certainly not being caused by oxygen. So we spent a bit of time wondering or worrying about what's causing this discomfort response. And before we could do that, we had to define how much of a change in comfort matters. And that's not that straightforward because you can't manipulate comfort in the eye to do a classic just noticeable difference uh, experiment. So we had to think about something else. And, and what we did was we put the same lenses, same kind of lenses in both eyes and have people rate the difference between those lenses. And from that, we were able to estimate that the just noticeable difference for contact lens related comfort is around about seven units. And that became useful in, in later work. So then we did some other things trying to work out what things contribute to the discomfort response. And, and uh, among other things, we discovered that solutions matter. So if you eliminate solutions, you can improve the comfort response. Um, taking the lens out during the day is interesting because we do get a small increase in comfort if you take the lenses out halfway through the day, but that disappears by the end of the day. So the changes associated with the contact lens, deposition, dehydration, don't seem to be the things that drive the comfort response. It's actually the time that the contact lens is in the eye. And we were able to uh, actually confirm that in a set of other studies where we looked at the time of day versus the length of time the lenses are in the eye. So this work with uh, John McNally and Danny Tilly and other people uh, were able to demonstrate that, that response. So we knew a few things about what was causing the comfort response. But we really thought, OK, so how are we doing? Do contact lenses, are they doing OK? Or are they still not doing very well in terms of this response? So what we did was to compare con contemporary lenses with not wearing a lens at all. So in this chart, um, emetropes who don't wear contact lenses, that's the green dot at the origin, are compared in terms of their insertion comfort response and end of day comfort response with a number of lens types. And you can see the lenses fall on the bottom uh, left-hand side of this graph, indicating they're not as good as a non-lens wearer, obviously. But the dotted line is the just noticeable difference that we talked about before. And you can see that some lenses fall on or just inside this line. So they're not doing too badly on average. Other lenses, of course, are outside the line, so there is a, a range of response in, in lenses that are available. And interestingly, spectacles are outside the line as well. So spectacle wearers are not that happy about their, their correction, which is interesting. And other people, including Jason Nichols, have suggested the same thing. Um, you can add other factors into this as well. And when you add in vision uh, to this uh, situation, the situation is not quite so rosy. Uh, the JND response can, uh, changes shape because vision has a, a different profile. But you can see now all the lenses fall outside this, uh, if you like, zone of tolerability. So we do have a little bit of work to do still. Um, to get towards the perfect contact lens. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the dry eye research uh, that we've been uh, able to do. And um, the, the first thing that we uh, were uh, tasked with was thinking about how the meibomian gland um, interacts with the ocular surface and produces uh, the effects that it does. Um, and again, we kind of went back to basics and thought, well, you know, what, wh how do meibomian glands change during the course of a person's life? You need to kind of know that before you can understand how things like contact lenses um, may interfere or in impact their response. So we spent a bit of time studying the natural history of the meibomian gland, and among other things, we showed that the uh, meibomian gland dropout, the loss of glands uh, on the upper lid, um, diminishes over time in an almost linear fashion uh, with age. So as we get older, we linearly lose uh, meibomian gland um, uh, we, uh, 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 abilities in the eye. Um, another postgraduate student of mine, Walid Al-Gamdi, showed that if you then look at how contact lenses affect this situation, it kind of accelerates the situation by about two years. So contact lens wear kind of makes you two years older, if you like, in terms of your meibomian glands. But it plateaus after that, so it doesn't get any worse. So the longer you wear contact lenses doesn't seem to matter, but that first couple of years of wear does impact your meibomian glands. Another two uh, students did uh, really interesting things as well. Ling Li looked at the genetic basis for meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, and while initially we were able to find some genes in the first population she looked at, which was in India, 
We weren't able to confirm that those genes translated to an independent group um, in, in Australia. So we're still not quite sure what the situation is with respect to the um, genetic aspects of myobilmin gland dysfunction. Uh, Carolina Coonan, who um, uh, nicely you saw in the video, was looking at the relationship between the structure of the myobilmin gland and the symptoms that we produce. And uh, again, as, as other people have found, she wasn't able to find any very clear relationship between uh, those two things. Uh, Carolina also uh, looked at the lipid composition of not only the tears, but the mybum as well. Uh, and she found that the profile of lipids in, in mybum particularly um, differs between individuals uh, rather more than it does between a person from day to day. So we kind of have this sort of a fingerprint of, of lipids in our, in our um, uh, mybum, which differs a little bit from, from other people, which is an interesting finding. Actually, uh, Carolina also, in her thesis, mentioned this particular kind of lipids uh, called oafers, um, has maybe been linked to more severe uh, symptoms. And I think that might be one of the first mentions in, in the literature in her thesis that this uh, relationship exists. It's since become something that other people have mentioned. So um, I think Carolina might be one of the first to have, have, have discovered that. So because there is this lack of relationship between um, uh, symptoms and, and signs, uh, we wondered whether the metrics we were using weren't probably the right ones. And so um, I'm happy to say that a, a current student of mine, Fatima Iqbal, is continuing this um, uh, research to find if we can predict symptoms from uh, the signs that we see. And she's kind of getting somewhere with some slightly different metrics than the ones we traditionally use. So um, she's beginning to find that there may be some predictability of comfort responses, discomfort responses from these new metrics. She's also, I'm happy to say, continuing the lipid work. So uh, we'll have some extra details and data from that in, in years to come. So Fatima working with Jackie Tan and Fiona um, is uh, on, in a hot space at the moment. Um, one of the things I've done quite recently, actually, is to worry about um, how well we're able to actually diagnose dry eye. And um, this piece of work really just was done to remind clinicians and practitioners that just because you do a test for dry eye and it's positive, it doesn't necessarily mean that person actually has dry eye. There's an uncertainty involved with diagnosis. And when we quantified this uh, in, in the paper that, that just been published, actually, um, we found that this uncertainty is actually not, not trivial. It's, it's reasonably considerable. Um, so we're not saying that people um, shouldn't use these tests. It's become quite controversial, actually. I had a letter to my paper about this. Um, so I'm not saying that people shouldn't use these tests, but I think clinicians need to be aware that you're not necessarily going to find uh, that the person has dry eye just because that test is positive. There are other possibilities. So it's just something to, for these um, uh, people doing these diagnostic things to be uh, concerned about. We need better tests is, I guess, the, the take home from this work. And just to, to finish up here, I just want to talk about some work that, that we're currently doing. Um, and Maria Marcouli, who is a, a former student of mine, um, and I are working with these uh, three fantastic neurologists at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney. Uh, and this has been a really fantastic collaboration, very interesting. And we're looking at the intersection between um, the ocular surface and neurological conditions. And the conditions that we've been particularly concerned about are multiple sclerosis, diabetes, and migraine. And it turns out that uh, Amelina, again, our current PhD student, and she just published this paper last week in the journal Headache. Amelina has found that actually the nerves of the corneal surface, particularly in, in the, 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 the cornea itself, um, are affected in people with migraine. So their nerve structure modifies um, during uh, the, the migraine process. And it turns out that the severity of that uh, modification is correlated with the severity of the migraine in terms of its frequency and intensity of the attacks. So this work is ongoing and it's, it's fantastically interesting and it's a new direction for me. Um, so I'm very uh, pleased to, to be involved with that. So just finally, you'll be aware from this presentation that you know, I've had a, a number of fantastic students who've basically done a lot of the work that uh, I've spoken to you about this morning. So I'm really very grateful to them for their uh, activities, for their work, uh, and, and as I said in the, in the talk, for teaching me a, a whole range of things about life, the universe, and everything. 
Um, I just finally, I just wanted to, to mention Suzanne, my partner, um, who really is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And so uh, she can't be here because uh, lots of reasons. But um, thanks, Sue, and thank you for you for listening and the Academy again for this wonderful award. Thank you very much.